Okay. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jennifer Thomas, Membership and Development Coordinator here at New Hampshire Audubon. I'd like to first acknowledge that I'm here from our state headquarters in Concord, New Hampshire, which is located within the ancient site of Penacook and Nadikana, which is the traditional ancestral homeland and waterways of the Abenaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki peoples past and present. I would like to also acknowledge and honor with gratitude, the land and waterways and our ancestors, Alnabak or the humans who have stewarded Nadikana through the generations for thousands of years. I invite you to learn more about the indigenous presence on the land you occupy by visiting the website native-land.ca. Here, you can explore and click on territories of indigenous people and get connected to resources to learn more. And for a more in-depth understanding of the Granite State, check out all the educational resources at indigenousnh.com, including this interactive map that details the indigenous presence and their stories here in New Hampshire. These resources, among others, have helped the staff here at New Hampshire Audubon recognize the ongoing consequences of colonialism for all people of color and the need to change in our current society. Thank you for your interest in tonight's topic, Native Bees of New England, their diversity in natural history with Michael Veet. Michael is a retired high school biology teacher and native bee enthusiast. As you may know, this talk is the eighth session of a year-long webinar series called Exploring Connections to and Stewardship of the Natural World, supported by the New Hampshire Humanities Council's grant program. The past recordings of these excellent talks can be found on New Hampshire Audubon's YouTube page, which are linked on the series webpage. Throughout the, this series, we are exploring the intersection of the sciences and the humanities, finding and forging new ways to connect with nature and learn about the importance of conservation action. This talk is the fourth in a series of seven total talks focusing, focusing on pollinator conservation. And we are happy to have Michael here for this topic. However, before I hand it over to Michael for tonight's presentation, I would like to take this opportunity to briefly describe how this webinar fits into the larger mission of New Hampshire Audubon. For those who don't know, New Hampshire Audubon is a state-based environmental nonprofit organization that is completely independent from National Audubon. We rely on members and donors like you to support our charitable mission, which has four programmatic pillars connecting people to nature through environmental education experiences, like school programs, nature day camp, and webinars like these, researching and conserving species in peril, including large raptors and small birds, managing about 10,000 acres of wildlife sanctuaries throughout the state for habitat and recreation, and advocating for sound environmental policy in the New Hampshire State Legislature. I am here today because of donors and members like you. We also rely on a huge network of over 2,000 volunteers who with wildlife monitoring, ambassador animal care, environmental education, and wildlife sanctuary management throughout the state. If you are a volunteer, member, or supporter of New Hampshire Audubon, I would like to sincerely thank you. Especially with the challenging year we've all been through, we simply couldn't achieve our charitable mission without you. If you would like to become a part of our, our conservation family, please check out our website for ways to get involved and we'll be dropping that link into the chat. We do have over 100 people registered this evening. So you'll see that we are in full webinar Zoom, Zoom mode. That said, please feel free to use the chat for any thoughts, comments and reactions you might have and the Q&A fe feature for any questions. For fun, try typing into the chat where you are watching this presentation from. It's been great to see the vast geographies we've been able to reach through these webinars. So that others may engage with you, make sure to change where you are sending your chat messages to 
all panelists and attendees. Who knows, you may just meet your next door neighbor on here. Diane DeLuca, the senior biologist responsible for orchestrating this series and I will be monitoring the chat and question and answer feature and stopping to answer questions throughout the presentation about halfway through and then again at the end. I've also set the parameters of the Q&A so that other attendees can see all the questions that are being asked and can comment or upvote the question that they want to see answered. I imagine we'll have more questions than we have time for, so this process will help us hone in on what questions the most people want asked. Without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Diane to introduce this evening's presenter. Thanks, Jen. Um, I'm very excited to introduce Michael V tonight. Michael is a retired high school biology teacher and he became interested in native bees about 15 years ago after spending many years studying and surveying the dragonflies and damselflies of New England and before that studying black flies at the University of New Hampshire for his master's degree. Since then, he spent many of his summers traveling around Massachusetts and the other New, New England states surveying and making discoveries regarding the native bee diversity of our region. I'm thrilled to have him speak on native bees of New England, their diversity in natural history. Thanks, Michael. Oh, am I live here? You're live, you, so you need to share your screen. Okay. All right. Can everybody see that? I hope so. Uh, well, well. Um, first of all, I just want to thank New Hampshire Audubon, um, and especially Diane and Jessica for giving me this opportunity. Um, it's always a pleasure to share one's passion with uh, enthusiastic and interested audience, and I hope uh, I'm sure that you will be. So what I have for you this morning is a slide presentation um, as an introduction to the wonderful diversity of bees that inhabit our fields and gardens here in New England. So you're gonna see a lot of images of bees throughout the slideshow. <clears throat> All of those bees um, are bees from New England, um, which uh, you can see. So Michael, so I have some yeah, Michael, we're not we're not seeing your screen right now, so you can try really? to share screen again. Okay, let me go back here. Just a second. Uh, okay. How's that? That. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Give me one second here. Let's see. St can you still see it? I assume you can. Yes. Sorry. My mute okay. wouldn't go off. Yes, we can see okay. the screen. It looks great. Okay, great. So I so I have some goals for this evening. So um, as probably you already know, uh, bees are pretty amazing creatures, and uh, few people really know uh, more than uh, if you could if you tried to name the number of kinds of bees that you could that you can name. You know, most people are unable to get very far beyond bumblebees, honeybees, maybe some sweat bees or um, uh, leaf cutter bees. But there's a whole lot more about bees to know. So I'm hoping that as a result of my talk that um, I'll be able to broaden and deepen your knowledge and appreciation of bees. I also, also hope that as a result of my talk tonight that you'll take some time to look a little bit more closely at bees. So I don't expect people to run outside tomorrow after my presentation and um, you know to, to your garden or to, or to a field and look at bees, but I hope that um, you know, this will inspire you to look a little bit more closely when you're out in the natural world. So to that end, I'm gonna point out some features and behaviors of bees that you can look for when you're out watching. And uh, lastly, um, I hope to inspire you to do a little something more to help preserve bees and pollinators. So 
I'm probably preaching to the choir here, and probably most people who are listening tonight are already doing things, but I'm hoping that um, maybe I can give you something small that you're not doing yet that you may able may be able to do to, um, to promote bees. Michael, just one more. Um, we're seeing your notes as well. You are. I'm not okay. sure if you can share your, your slide program. Okay, let me try something. How's that? Whoops. Yep, perfect. Okay. Okay. Um, so, um, as we know, oops, as we know, bees are really important uh, because of their um, pollination surfaces. So, um, as we know, bees are really important in agriculture. So, in North America, many or most of our fruits, vegetable, fruits and vegetables um, are pollinated by bees. And um, that's, that's true in, uh, in North America and New England, but that's true the world over. Bees are also important, maybe even more important in how they support the, the biodiversity. So by pollinating plants, bees are, are, um, are providing food, they're providing shelter, and providing building materials for many, many other organisms. I'm having a little difficulty here. Okay, so uh, there are uh, plenty of other uh, insects that pollinate, uh, pollinate uh, flowers and, and plants like beetles, flies, and um, even wasps. But bees are the only one of those that actively collect nectar and pollen to feed their young. Those other pollinators, they collect pollen and drink nectar for their own good. They eat pollen, some of them eat pollen, they drink nectar for their own benefit. Um, so because uh, bees collect pollen to provide for their young, they have an adaptation that they have branched hairs. So most female bees have branched hairs that are concentrated in areas we call scopi. That's a term I'm going to use throughout the night. So depending on the bee, those scopi are located in different areas. I'm going to try and use my, um, my laser pointer here. So some bees, most bees, have their scopi, these concentrated patches of hairs, on their legs, like this little bee here and this bee here. Other bees have their scopi on the underside of their abdomen. Some bees don't have scopi. They have a different structure called a corbicula. So honeybees and bumblebees have this flat area on their hind leg called a corbicula where they transport their pollen. So bees will collect pollen on the hairs on their body, transport that to their scopi, and carry the, that pollen back to the nest. This is something that you can look for when you observe bees. You can look to see where the scopi are located. You can also look to see whether they're carrying the pollen dry or whether they're moistening the pollen with some nectar and, um, and placing that in their scopi. Besides, there's a lot of organisms out there, a lot of insects that mimic bees, that you can easily confuse with bees. Um, there are wasps and there are a lot of flies that actually mimic bees. So these are some images of some bee mimic flies. So bee mimic flies can be hairy like bees, but they don't have branched hairs. They can carry pollen, but they don't carry pollen in scopi, but they can have like this soldier beetle here, fake scopi. There's a, there, it has a, a colored patch of integument here that may, might make it look like scopi. So there's ways that you can differentiate bee mimic flies from real bees. Probably the easiest way is to look at their antennae. So bee antennae are longer and elbowed. Most fly antennas are short. Another feature you can look for is to look at the waist. So most bees have a much narrower waist than flies do. This bee here is a soldier fly. It's a good fake. 
it's got long antennae. Um, so that one might be a diff difficult one to differentiate from bees. Um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, flies also have a pair of wings, whereas bees have four wings. You can find bee mimic flies along with flies on, on flowers. So we have a poll question for you. I think that uh, Jennifer is going to put that up for you. Um, how many bees, bee species do you think there are in New England? So while, uh, while people are answering that question, I'm going to talk a little bit about this particular bee right here. So this is a really interesting bee. This is the this name of this bee. Its scientific name is Duforia nova ingle. It's a bee that specializes on pickerel weed. Most of you probably know the plant pickerel weed. It's a beautiful purple flowered plant that grows in wetlands. This is a female, obviously, because you can see pollen in its, on the scopae in its hind legs here, but also you can see it has its tongue extended. So this is a behavior that you can sometimes see in bees where they extend their tongue with nectar on it in order to evaporate the water out of the nectar and to concentrate the pollen. So let's see. Do we have any results from our poll? We do, Michael. So we have a wide range of guesses here. Uh -huh. Well, um, let's see what the answer is. I'm going to go to the next slide here. So in, in New England, we have about 400 species of bees, probably a little bit more than 400 species. Um, some of you were right on with your predictions and a lot of other, other of you were pretty close with that. So the bees as a group are pretty speciose, meaning that there are quite a few species, number of species of bees. Bees tend to be most speciose in areas that are relatively dry. We say have a Mediterranean climate. So in the Western United States, like in California, there are a lot of species of bees, 1,400 species in California alone. In the tropics, like in um, tropical rainforests, we have fewer species of bees. United States, for its land mass, for its land area, has a relatively large number of species compared to other areas of the world of the same area. And that's in part because we have these um, dry Mediterranean Mediterranean type climate areas in the West, but it's also it's also just because the United States is a little bit more um, explored in terms of the number of bee species out there. So, in um, so I keep a, a list of bees for Massachusetts. In Massachusetts, our official list is about 390 bees. There are bees in Northern uh, New Hampshire and Northern Vermont and Maine that we don't find in Massachusetts. We have bees in Southern Connecticut that we don't find in Massachusetts also. New Hampshire, there's no official list for New Hampshire yet, but uh, my list of New Hampshire bees is about 350. So if we compare the number of species of bees to other animal groups, we see that Bees are, are quite speciose compared to others. You know, there's more species of bees than there are mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians, but they're fewer than fish. If we compare the number of bees to other insect groups, um, there are about 5,000 species of dragonflies and damselflies worldwide. There are about 11,000 species of grasshoppers worldwide. There are about 18,000 species of butterflies worldwide. <clears throat> so, uh, and there are, of course, many, many more um, species of beetles than there are of any group of insects. But bees compare pretty, um, pretty closely to butterflies in their diversity. So there is a huge diversity <clears throat> morphologically in structure amongst the bees in New England. So we've got bees of all kinds of colors. So we've got blue bees like this um, little mason bee right here. We've got green bees like this sweat bee over here. We've got bees that are red like this cuckoo bee we have over here. 
We even have orange bees. We've got bees of all kinds of different sizes. Bees from as large as bumblebees, an inch and a, up to an inch or an inch and a half long, and bees as small as just a few millimeters, like this little teeny tiny sweat bee here. We've got bees with really long tongues, like this male longhorn beetle here, for reaching down deep into the corolla of plants that have long corollas. And we've got bees with short tongues that can access only uh, plants that, are, that don't have long corollas. We've got really hairy bees like bumblebees and like this male leafcutter bee right here. We also have bees that are almost hairless like this cuckoo bee right here and like this cuckoo bee right here. So we have this huge diversity of structure among bees in New England. We also have a lot of behavioral, behavioral diversity also. So most of our bees might be surprising to some people are solitary bees. That means that a single female establishes the net, a nest, provisions the brood cells in that nest and lays an eggs on there. She never gets to see her offspring. She dies before, they're, um, before they, they develop and they emerge. We have about 18% of our bees in New England are social. So that means they live in colonies. They usually have a single queen and they, um, and they, uh, they raise their, their young as a group. And they usually, all, they, they usually have castes like a queen and, a, and a, um, a queen and worker bees also. And then a relatively large percentage, 25% are what we call brood parasites. Brood parasites are some of our most fascinating bees. These are bees that do not where the females do not collect their own pollen and do not provision their own cells, but they are bees that lay their eggs in the nest cells of other bees. I'm gonna have more to say about them a little bit later. And then we have well, what are known as social parasites, relatively few social parasites. Social parasites are bees that lay their eggs in the nests of social bees. So for example, there are a number of social parasi socially parasitic bumblebees that will enter, the, the, the female will enter the nest of a, of a bumblebee species and will dispatch the, the host um, queen and then she'll lay her eggs in, um, in the nest cells within the bumblebee, the host bee, and the host bee workers will raise her, her young. So we also have diversity amongst the, um, the type of nests that bees, the style of nests that bees um, manufacture. So we can group bees into two, um, two major categories, what we call the minor bees, like up here, and what we call cavity nesting bees. So these are all cavity, ne cavity nesting bees. Minor bees, they nest in the ground, as the name implies. Cavity nesting bees nest in cavities, such as beetle burrows in dead trees and dead wood, such as cracks and crevices in rocks and between rocks, such as hollow twigs. Sometimes we refer, we, refer to, uh, we refer to these cavity nesting bees as renters. Um, so all these bees, no matter whether you're a miner or you're a cavity nesting bees, they, they um, line their nest cells with something to help keep moisture in and help keep too much moisture from entering. So mining bees, they uh, line their nest cells with secretions from the end of the abdomen that, are, that form uh, a waxy or a cellophane-like layer on the inside of the nest cells. Leafcutter bees, as the name implies, they cut discs out of leaves and use those to line their nest cells. You can sometimes 
find um, these uh, leaves that have a disc removed from them that was um, cut out by a leaf cutter bee. So leaf cutter bees use their, their jaws like scissors to quickly cut out these discs. If you've ever seen it happen, it's pretty fascinating. It happens pretty quickly. Oftentimes the bee, the female bee will, re will return to the same leaf with the same plant to, re uh, to cut out these discs. Um, so it's something that you can look for. In my yard, I have um, some red bud trees and the leaf cutter bees seem to prefer the red, the red bud trees. They prefer leaves that are a little bit shiny and a little bit thick. They don't like leaves that are really hairy. Carter bees, they scrape hairs from the surface of plants that they utilize to line their nests. So we have two species of Carter bees in New England. Both of them are introduced from Europe. This one here is the most common one. And uh, you can commonly find them if you have a garden that has lamb's ear in your garden, you can often find them um, scraping hairs off of lamb's ear, or you can see on the lamb's ear, the tracks from where they've removed the hairs. And the mason bees are bees that use mud to line their nest cells or their nests um, mason bees, you can find mason bees. I most often find mason bees collecting mud in the forest along trails where there is a wet spot and there is uh, some, um, some exposed mud there. So most minor bees, so most of our bees are minor bees and most minor bees nest in areas that are open and sunny and where the soil has a high sand content or has some clay in there. You don't find many mining bees nesting in the forest. There are some that do nest in the forest. Most of those are bees that emerge really early in the spring before the trees leaf out. And you don't find them nesting in the forest where there is a very thick organic mulchy layer there. They just can't penetrate that. So um, there is a, um, a bee nest opening in this image right here. See if you can find it. You probably, are, have, probably have tried already. So bee nests are, are hard to find because they're small, they're often hidden, and because you rarely, um, the bees spend very little time entering or leaving the nest. So it's easiest to find them to look for females flying close over the ground, um, flying back to the, to the nest opening. So they spend very little time entering or leaving the nest because that will, um, will give them away. So here is the uh, nest opening right here of a bee, of a mining bee. This was, a, this was uh, in an area along a um, power line right away where there was a no, number of bees nesting in, in that area. So um, here are some other kinds of renters, some other renters. So this is a tree, obviously a tree with a lot of old beetle burrows in here. Um, bees love to nest, leaf cutter bees especially, inside these beetle burrows. And there are other bees, and there are other bees that will nest in there too. There are a number of stem nesting bees. So this is a little small carpenter bee that has nested in the stem of a cat mint in uh, my garden, in my backyard. These are relatively easy to find um, if you look for the tailings that are left behind, that the, uh, these are pieces of the inner pulp of the stem that the bee has chewed off and has deposited at the um, entrance of the nest. Okay, so, um, these are some images of some, of some typical nests, bee nests. So there's a huge array of different structures. And these are just a few examples here. So this is an example of a mining bee nest. Sometimes bees um, accumulate a little hill, a little mound outside their nest. And that's sometimes a giveaway for where the nest occurs. Uh, but most bees do not. 
So mining bees, they usually build a vertical, a vertical tunnel with side tunnels off of those and the side tunnels ending in what we call a brood chamber or a nest cell. Cavity nesting bees, like leafcutter bees, they um, will, in, in, a, in a cavity, um, le, uh, make a series of uh, nest cells. Leafcutter bees, of course, line theirs with, um, uh, with leaves. You can, hear the, you can see here the pollen mass. Here's the egg on there. And you can see that the larva that hatches from the egg is consuming the pollen mass growing and um, eventually gets full grown and pupates. So um, here's another example of a leaf cutter nest. This is a type of mason bee nest that makes its nest out of tree resins, like tree sap. It creates these little balls and it sticks those together and makes a nest cell out of that. And here's an example of a carpenter bee, which uses the wood shavings to put partitions between its nest cells. Okay, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the um, life cycle of a bee. So like I mentioned, so like, um, like nest cell construction, there's a large diversity in the life cycles of bees. But this is a general life cycle of a mining bee. You know, mining bees are our most common bees here. So um, most, most bees, um, most bees that, that emerge early in the spring over winter as an adult. Bees that emerge later in the summer or even in the fall, usually over winter, in a pupil or what we call a pre-pupil stage. And then the pupa develops into the adult over the summer, and then that bee emerges later in the season. So um, the, adult, the adult female bee emerges and um, it mates soon after it emerges. In many species of bees, males emerge earlier than females, and then they will mate with the female as they are emerging or soon afterwards. So most bees, female bees, only mate once in their life, and they store the sperm, enough sperm, to fertilize all their eggs. Bees have a relatively low fecundity, our native, our native solitary bees. So in a lifetime for a female bee, she may only lay a half a dozen or a dozen eggs. So the females mate once and they usually mate right after they uh, emerge. And after they emerge and they're mated, they begin looking for the appropriate location to build a nest. So they may try starting a nest in several locations before they find one that's appropriate, where the soil is of the right conditions to enable them to, um, to, to build, to dig the, their tunnels and their nest cells. So, so the bee builds the main tunnel, it builds a side tunnel, and then it makes the nest cell. Once it's got the nest cell completed and lined, the female bees go out and they begin to forage. They begin to collect pollen, they begin to collect nectar, and they make multiple trips. Some species make up to 35 or 40 trips to collect pollen and collect nectar before they have enough to sufficiently provision the cell. They take that pollen, they form it usually into a, a ball. Um, some of those balls have projections in different shapes. They lay an egg on the pollen loaf, and then they seal the cell. Then they build another side tunnel and another nest cell and go out and forage and provision that. The egg, um, usually laid on the pollen mass, the egg will hatch after a couple of days. The larva will begin to feed on the pollen mass. As the larva gets larger, the pollen mass gets smaller. They molt 
four or five times before they reach their last larval stage called the prepupal stage. Like I said before, many times the prepupal stage is the stage that they will overwinter in. Sometimes it's the pupil, it's the pupil stage. But within the pupa, the pupa develops into the adult and then the adult adults emerge. And there are, like I mentioned, a lot of variations in that, but that's the basic, the life cycle. I should say a little something about, about male bees. Most of what I said so far, uh, so far applies uh, most directly to female bees, but male bees are important also. You don't see male bees nearly as often as you see female bees, and that is because they're a little less, uh, they're a little more short-lived. They don't live as long as a female bee. Uh, most solitary bees uh, will, uh, females will live as a, adults for maybe two or three weeks at most. Um, so the males um, spend less time on the flowers and more time searching for females. Male bees can mate multiple times, whereas most female bees only mate once. And male bees aren't as important pollinators as females. So they often have hairs. They have branched hairs. Um, here is a male bee that is just covered with pollen, with uh, willow pollen. And um, they may have pollen, but they don't have the pollen concentrated in scopy like the females do. To tell a male bee from a female, once you've, once you've seen a few males, it's obvious that their antennae are longer than female antennae are. In fact, male bee antennae contain one more segment than female antennae do. So male antennae, the, uh, the flagellum has 11 segments, where in females, it only has 10 segments. Male bees also tend to have a narrower abdomen than females do. And of course, they don't carry pollen in, in, the, in, in scopy. So you won't see um, pollen concentrated in scopy. So the fact that the male bees have such long antennae says a little bit, a little bit of something about how important their antennae uh, inten are and how important chemical communication are in bees, especially in male bees. So they use pheromones given off by the females in order to locate the females for mating. Because their antennae are so important, you sometimes can see male bees, and you sometimes see it in female bees, cleaning their antennae. So this is something that you can look for when you're observing bees. You can, first of all, look to see if the bee is a male or a female, but sometimes you can also see male bees or female bees cleaning their antennae. They get pollen and other material stuck to their antennae that um, compromises their function. They have a special antenna cleaning structure on the front, um, sort of the elbow of the first segment of their legs that they, that they draw their antennae through. Um, I have a surprising number of photographs of bees cleaning their antennae. And that's not because I see it so often, but it's because it's one of the few times that a bee will stand still so that you can get a good photograph. Another thing that you can look for. Okay, so um, at this point, um, I think what I'll do is I'll answer questions, a few questions um, for, from anybody in the audience based upon um, my first set of slides. So are there any questions out there? Now, Michael, there are a few questions. Um, I think I'll kind of split them into different categories. So one, one person, just to kind of um, look at the morphology of the bee, they asked, what exactly are branched hairs and how do they look different from non-branched hairs? Okay, let me just shoot back to that slide. 
So, uh, so this is a uh, electron micrograph of the branched hairs of, of, of the bees. So these hairs are branched. You can see the branches that come off of them. The number of branches and, the den and how dense those branches will depend upon, uh, to some degree, the type of pollen that the bee is collecting. So we're gonna talk a little bit later about specialist bees. So some bees specialize on plants that have really fine pollen and they're gonna have a lot of branches. The branches may even be branched. And there are bees that um, specialize on other types of plants that have large pollen granules and they're gonna have um, you know, branches, less branched hairs. Okay, here's here's some a few questions about nesting. So, how does egg chamber timing work with cavity bees? The first one deposits, the last one out. That's correct, yeah, and that's a and that's a really uh, is a great question, and um, it leads to something that I probably should have mentioned when I talked a little bit about um, about male bees. So, uh, so first of all, yeah, that's how it works. So, what'll happen is when the adults emerge. Um, the, um, the bee uh, that's deepest in the cavity nest. So the, the, the bee that developed first from the first pollen loaf that was, um, was constructed by the female, it'll wait until all the bees have fully developed and then um, they, um, they'll, they'll emerge in order. Sometimes um, the bees will begin to buzz and that's a um, signal that everybody's ready to emerge. In some species, however, the one that develops earliest, the one that's deepest in the cavity, will actually, um, you know, uh, it'll open up its next cell and it'll slide past, work its way past the other bees and emerge first. So one thing I didn't mention about uh, male bees that I should have, people may be aware of this, that males develop from unfertilized eggs, whereas females develop from fertilized eggs. So the female bee can determine the ratio of males to females in the nest, and it can also determine the timing of, of when those, um, when they fertilize the eggs. So in these cavity nesting bees, so I'll take, take a little step uh, backwards and remind you that in many species of bees, males emerge first and they'll wait for females to emerge so that they have an advantage over other bees of the same species in mating with the females. Um, some male bees actually, ac actually will dig into the soil and mate with female bees before they emerge. But so um, females, will often wait until these female cavity nesting bees will create male eggs, uh, will be some of the last, some of the last nest cells that they create will be the males so that the males can emerge first. A long, a, a long involved uh, answer, but, um, but, but I, hope that, I hope that sufficiently answers your question. Yeah, and then a couple that kind of go along with that. Um, this question came from Julie and she says, when do they come out? I'm not sure if that was mentioned, like the time of year, the month, although I'm assuming that, that um, that's different for different bees, so. That's right, so there's, so, so there's, a whole, there's a whole sort of suite of bees that will emerge throughout the season. So the earliest bees will start to emerge in probably um, late March or April, depends on the temperature. And bees will, uh, new species of bees will continue to emerge um, until September, maybe even October. So these solitary bees, they are pretty short lived, like I mentioned, they, o they only live for um, two or three weeks. So there's a su succession of species that will emerge throughout the summer. Social bees, um, the nests are long lived. So they tend to emerge fairly early and persist throughout the rest of the summer. I'm gonna talk a little in, in, in a few slides about bees that specialize 
they're pollen specialists. So they specialize on the pollen of particular plants. Those bees time their emergence with the flowering of the plants that they specialize on. So there are a number of other questions, but I think I'll share this one out and then we can try to get to some of the others at the end. And this okay. is a, an interesting question. Has this odd spring, cold, hot, cold, been detrimental to bees? I've seen none at my flowers, usually my catmint now in full bloom is full of bumblebees and others, but there's none there. I saw a few very early before blooms were available. Yeah, that's, that, that's, a, that's a very tough question to answer. Uh, there's a lot of uh, natural variation from year to year in, the, in, in bees and the, um, you know, the number of bees that, that come out. It's really, it's really hard to know uh, if you're seeing fewer bees in your garden, what the, what the cause of that is. It could be this fluctuation in temperature that we're having. Um, it could be other factors also. Um, it could ha have been, um, you know, a result of the drought from last year. You know, it's really, it's really difficult to know what's going on there. We really can't um, assess changes in bee populations um, in the short term, like from year to year. Um, you really have to look at, you have to survey count bees over a long period of time before you can really know whether there are, their populations are increasing or, de or decreasing. There's just too much year to year natural variation that occurs. Okay, so maybe um, I've got a few more slides. Let's look at a few more slides and then we can answer some more questions at the end. So I mentioned a little bit earlier about brood parasites. There's some of our, some of my favorite bees. They're some of the most fascinating of all bees. Um, we also sometimes refer to those as kleptoparasitic bees or cuckoo bees. Cuckoo bees after the cuckoo bird, the European cuckoo bird, and sometimes our North American species that lay their eggs in the nests of other bees. So our brood parasites tend to be um, pretty specific in the groups of bees that they parasitize. So this bee up here in the upper left, this brood parasite belongs to the genus Celioxis and it specializes in parasitizing the nests of leafcutter bees. This bee over here is, belongs to the genus Nomada. It specializes in um, parasitizing the nests of our largest group of mining bees. This bee here down in the lower left belongs to the genus Sphicodes. This, uh, the genus Sphicodes primarily parasitizes the nests of sweat bees. This bee right here is a very interesting um, parasitic bee, um, very specialized in that it parasitizes only um, the few species, the two or three species of bees that we have that are oil collecting bees. I'll have a little bit more to say about those later. But these brood parasitic bees tend to look a lot like wasps. Wasps, of, of course, are the closest relative of bees, but also they resemble wasps because they don't tend to be really hairy. That's because they don't collect their own pollen. They all have hair, they all have branched hair, but they're much less hairy than pollen collecting bees are. They also have a number of features in common. They tend to have a very thick cuticle, very thick integument. Their integument is also, tends to be very rough and pocked. And they also have, often have overhanging like shelves or flanges of integument that covers some of their more vulnerable, vulnerable spots. This is because um, these, um, this is for protection against the sting of female 
pollen collecting bees. If a female pollen collecting bee encounters one of these parasitic bees while it's invading its nest, it's going to try and attack that bee and sting it. So the strategies that these brood parasites use are a little bit different from each other. Some of them will force their way into a nest, encounter and fight the host female and uh, make it past the host female and then deposit their egg in the uncompleted nest cell of the host bee. This is Sphicodes tend to be uh, some of the more aggressive and forceful of the brood parasites. Um, and uh, so they'll lay their egg in the wall of the nest cell so that it's less detectable by the host bees. Um, other bees tend to sneak inside the nest of the host bee while the host bee is out foraging. In fact, you can sometimes, this is another thing to look for, is to look for these types of brood parasites flying close over the ground, looking for the nests of mining bees. Sometimes you'll see them like this bee right here, perched on a twig or on a dried leaf on the ground, waiting for the female bee to exit the nest so that it can sneak in there and lay its egg. So um, most of these bees will enter the host nest and lay its egg in the host's brood cell before she has finished provisioning and closing the nest. This bee has a point at the end of its abdomen Remember, this bee parasitizes leafcutter bee nests. It uses this point to make a hole in the completed nest cell of the leafcutter bee and deposit its egg inside. So the egg of the parasite hatches, and oftentimes the first instar, for some of these species anyways, the first instar have these huge jaws. The huge jaws are used to destroy either the egg of the host bee or the larva of the host bee to kill it, and then it proceeds to eat the nest provisions and develop it on its own in the, uh, in the nest cell. Pretty fascinating, um, pretty beautiful bees. Okay, so most female bees are pollen generalists. That means that they will collect pollen from a lot of different flowers, pollen and nectar from a lot of different flowers. Social bees, like bumblebees and our other social bees, all basically have to be generalists because their nest, their colony is existing through a relatively long period of time, maybe all summer, so they have to be able to take advantage of flowers that are flowering at different periods throughout the entire, entire season, entire summer. Um, what sometimes will limit the type of flower that the general species can access is, their, is the length of their tongue. So some generalist bees, this is a type of mason bee here, have a long tongue and will be able to access the nectar and the resources in a flower like this mint that has a long corolla. Short tongued bees like, um, like this um, small carpenter bee here might not be able to access those and will have to concentrate on collecting nectar and pollen from bees that don't have a corolla. So size of the bee can also limit the flowers uh, which it can, uh, it can visit. So bees that are large can't visit flowers that are, have a really, uh, bees that are large and have a short tongue can't visit flowers that are small and have a corolla. But small bees 
can enter the corolla of a plant even if it doesn't have a long tongue and access their resources. So about 80% of our bees are generalists. About 20% of our bees are pollen specialists. That means that they collect pollen and usually nectar from a relatively narrow range of plants. It's usually a genus of plants, sometimes a family of plants. So for example, we have pollen specialists, we have a lot of pollen specialists who specialize on goldenrod. We have pollen specialists that specialize on collecting from yellow loose stripes. So this is the oil collecting bee that I mentioned earlier. Yellow loose stripes, we have like three or four species of yellow loose stripes here in New England, have these little glands at the base of this, uh, the pistil here that produce pollen. And these oily, oil collecting bees have special pads on the ends of their forelegs that they utilize to soak up that pollen, that, that, um, that oil, they use that oil to moisten the pollen that they concentrate in their scopy. They also use that to line their nests, to water, waterproof their nest cells. We've got bees that specialize on vaccinium, on blueberries. This bee here is a vaccinium specialist. Many of our vaccinium our blueberry specialists buzz pollinate. This is because the flower structure of a blueberry is such that they don't release their pollen very readily, um, but they will release their pollen if they're vibrated at the right frequency. Because these uh, blueberry flowers have a relatively long corolla, Many of the blueberry bees are either long tongued or they have a really long face for reaching inside those, the corolla. So this is a bee, I don't know if you can see that very well, that has a really long face that enables it to access the nectaries inside there. This is a wild geranium specialist. Wild geranium has very large pollen. Um, you can see the pollen in the scopy of this, of this bee here. Therefore, their scopy are, uh, have evolved to have fairly few branches and the hairs are separated by a relatively long distance. They're not as dense as something like a bee that specializes on willow. So willow has really teeny tiny pollen. So these willow specialists have scopy that have very dense hairs and highly branched hairs for picking up the willow pollen. Here's a bee that, a uh, very interesting bee that specializes on squashes. Um, it's a squash bee. This is a male squash bee. So squash bees have a very interesting story. There are no native North American squashes the squash bees arrived in North America with the Native Americans who came from South and Central America where there are native squashes. As they migrated into North America, they brought their crops with them, which included squashes, and along came the squash bee with them. If you grow squashes in your garden, like if you, if you grow pumpkins or cucumbers or summer squashes, you probably have squash bees visiting them. Male squash bees can often be found in the squash flowers early in the morning, first thing in the morning. These male squash bees will spend the night in the squash flowers waiting for the first females to arrive so that they can mate with them. We have a pretty long list of um, specialist flowers, specialist bees um, and the flowers that they, that they visit. So um, there's about um, uh, 
20, about 25% of our bees in the Northeast are specialists. And these are some of the plants that they specialize on. You'll see that there's a lot of diversity amongst these plants. There are plants um, of wetlands, like uh, some of our native dogwoods or mailberry. I love the mailberry bees. Mailberry bees are fascinating to me. So we've got wetland plants. We've got plants that are more apt to live in dry areas, like um, some of our blueberries and like yellow, not the yellow loop stripes. Well, we've got some species of yellow, yellow loop stripes that are um, tend towards more xeric environments. We've got other yellow loose stripes that live in uh, wetlands, like our swamp candles. We've got plants that are shrubs, like the mailberry, like the blueberries. We've got plants that are herbaceous, that are specialist bee plants. We've got plants that emerge really early in the spring, like the trout lilies do. And we've got other plants that, are, that um, have specialist bees that, um, that flower much later in the year, um, like the goldenrods do. So there's a whole host of specialist bee plants um, that um, certain species of bees are attracted to. So I just have a couple more slides. Um, uh, so um, the life of a bee uh, is not all flowers and nectar. So bees have a lot of trials and tribulations. There's a lot of things that prey on bees. A lot of critters that you can see, that you can observe when you're observing bees on flowers. So there are some predators of bees that are sit and wait predators, that are well camouflaged, that sit on flowers, that wait for bees to, bees and other insects to visit the flowers, and then they grab them really quickly. So uh, some examples of those are ambush bugs and crab spiders. Sometimes I'll be looking for bees in, on flowers and I'll notice a bee in the flower that is completely still and not moving. And then I'll look a little bit more closely and I'll see, wow, there's an ambush bug or there is a crab spider. Some crab spiders are very well camouflaged. That is sucking the hemolymph from that bee. We've got other predators of bees that are more active and actively hunt and pounce on bees. So dragonflies will take bees in flight opportunistically. A lot of bee, the bees that are, there are some bees I should have mentioned this earlier, that nest in aggregations. Um, there are some species that nest in aggregations along slopes and in slanty, sandy areas where there are tiger beetles. So tiger beetles will take uh, mining bees um, as they are emerging from the nest or pounce on them when they return to the nest also. This is a robber fly. Robber flies are are fascinating insects. This is a robber fly that is eating a bumblebee. And the robber fly is also a bumblebee mimic. You can often find these predators and other predators, there's lots of predator bees that are hanging around near flowers or on flowers where you see, bee, where you see bees um, visiting. So not only are there predators, but there are other types of kleptoparasites and internal parasites of bees. There's a whole host of them. You can imagine um, what a great resource a nest cell that's already provisioned with pollen and nectar, what a resource that is for uh, something that wants to exploit that. It's it's protected. It's a great area for your larvae to grow up successfully. So there's a whole host of other insects that, um, uh, that, that are nest parasites and in, internal parasites of, of bees. So I, these are images of a few. So this is a ripophorid beetle here. This is a 
blister beetle right here. Ripophorid beetles and blister beetles have this amazing strategy. They lay eggs on flowers, or sometimes they lay live larvae on flowers. <clears throat> the name of the flower is called a triangulin larva. When the bee, when a bee climbs onto the flower, is nectaring or collecting pollen on the flower, the larvae, <coughs> excuse me, climb onto the bee and get a ride back to the nest. Excuse me, just get a drink of water. Where they disembark and will hide in the nest cell. And when the female finishes provisioning and closes the nest cell, those triangulin larvae will either, depends on the species, either kill the egg or the early instar larva and consume the pollen mass, or in some of these, like the ripophorid beetle, they hide in the nest cell, wait for the bee larvae to become fully grown, become fully grown, uh, and then they consume the fully grown bee larva. This is a bee fly. Bee flies will hover outside the nest hole of a mining bee and they'll deposit either eggs or larvae. Oftentimes they'll shoot them into the mouth of the bee nest opening and then that larva climbs down into the net, into the tunnel and into a, a, a nest cell and like these other predator, like these other uh, kleptoparasites will remain in the nest cell until it's fully provisioned and then take, take advantage of those provisions. This is a, uh, a parasitic fly that larva is an internal parasite of bees. This is what is known as a conopid fly. They're pretty common um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, on, um, on flowers <coughs> late, uh, mid or late summer. So these guys, you can see them on flowers watching bees. And what they do is they attack the bee in midair and they have a little point, a uh, little pointy ovipositor and they develop and they inject an egg into the abdomen of the bee, and that egg um, hatches and the larva becomes an internal parasite of those bees. And uh, lastly, this is a velvet, called the velvet ant, is actually, uh, it's a female velvet ant, is actually a wingless wasp. Um, and you can see these guys um, crawling around on the, on the bare ground where mining bees are nesting. It's often a good clue if you see these guys crawling around, it's a good clue that there might be mining bees nesting in that area. Um, these guys have a very, um, a very strong stinger. These, wa these ones will force their way into a mining bee's nest and lay its eggs in a nest cell like some of these other guys. So the life of a bee isn't, um, like I say, isn't all nectar and flowers. So they're, um, so we're down to my last two slides here. Um, so um, there are there are a number, as we as we all know, that bees and other pollinators um, are having some problems. There have been documented declines in bees and other insects in a number of studies uh, throughout the world, um, and there are uh, a number of common threats that bees that our bees are experiencing and in other pollinators and other, um, and other insects. So these are some of the top um, threats that bees are dealing with these days. So habitat loss and habitat fragmentation is a big one caused by development and by agriculture. Bees need flowers, flowers need places to grow, beads Bees need places to nest, to nest. and um, uh, because of increased um, land being put into agriculture and because of fragmentation, uh, because of development, um, this uh, is leading to um, some loss of bee diversity here. 
So competition from exotic bees is a problem. Uh, um, so uh, we have about 40 species of introduced or exotic bees in the United States. In New England, we have about 20, I think uh, 19 in Massachusetts. Chief among our introduced or exotic bees as people may or may not know, are the honeybees. So the European honeybee was introduced in the United States way back when the, the pilgrims came to the United States. A competition between honeybees and exotic bees, other exotic bees for nectar and pollen resources, and in some cases nest sites um, are uh, a threat to bees. Overuse of pesticides, of course, especially organophosphates and neonicotinoids are a problem. I read an article just a few days ago about bees in nurseries. Um, a study that was done looking at organic nurseries compared to nurseries that use systemic pe pesticides. I wasn't aware of this, but a lot of nurseries use systemic pesticides and the diversity and number of bees in the um, non-organic nurseries was much less than it was in the organic um, nurseries. So path, path over, uh, pathogen spillover um, is a real potential problem um, exacerbated by the fact that honeybees are often transported over really long distances. These commercial honeybee uh, businesses, honeybee crop pollination businesses, where um, beehives can be transported over hundreds or, or, or thousands of miles. <clears throat> and, um, and if those honeybees have, have pathogens, some of those pathogens can jump over or have the potential to jump over to the native bee community. Invasive plants are a problem because invasive plants um, crowd out our native plants. And as we know, there are uh, uh, bees depend on plants and there are a number of specialist plants that specialist bees um, prefer. And of course, climate change, we're hearing more and more about climate change and the issues that it has, the potential issues that it has in some, in, in some, in some cases, proven issues that it has for insects and pollinators. Um, so, uh, there are some studies that have documented bees ranges changing, either moving further north or, or, or higher in elevation as a result of climate change. There are also problems or potential problems from extreme weather events um, like drought and floods that could affect um, pollinators insects and pollinators like bees also. Um, so I'm I, I know I'm probably preaching to the choir here because I'm sure that many of you already do a lot in your own lives and in your own yards and in your own property to benefit pollinators and benefit bees. But I have a, a list of some things here. So um, if you think about things that you can do to help conserve or help promote animals. There are not many animals where you can really impact conservation directly or as visibly as you can with, with bees and other pollinators. You can plant a wildflower garden in your yard and plant native flowers and you will see within a season or two more bees and more pollinators. You can do things that are small and that will directly impact and improve the conditions for bees and other pollinators. So some other things that you can do is minimize the use of pesticides. Rather than broadcast pesticides, um, everybody um, or most people use some pesticides. If you spot treat 
your um, invasive plants or spot treat for insect pests rather than broadcast those, you're going to impact many fewer bees. You can provide nesting sites. I talked earlier about the fact that most of our bees are solitary ground nesting bees, and they produce and they um, prefer to nest in areas that are sparsely vegetated and that are open. So you can not use as much mulch. You can provide bare areas where bees can nest. You can leave standing dead trees. You can not cut down your garden plants to the ground at the end of the season or the beginning of the season, but leave plants that have hollow pithy stems, you can leave those stems standing for pith nesting bees. Um, you can mow your lawn, your lawn less. There was, a, there was a study that was carried out a few years ago in Springfield, Massachusetts, that showed that if you mow your lawn, your lawn on a two week basis, rather than every week, that you'll get more bees visiting your property. Um, you can tolerate weeds. So there are a lot of bees that are attracted to dan dandelions and other reeds, uh, other uh, weedy plants. And of course, you can spread the word and you can support local conservation groups uh, that preserve land, promote pollinators, and fight for legislation to protect the, envi uh, to protect the environment, like New Hampshire Audubon and, uh, and many others. So that's about it for my talk. Um, I'll say one last thing, and that is if you want to go out and watch bees, and I hope I've inspired some of you maybe to go out and look a little bit more closely at bees, it really helps to have a pair of binoculars. Bees are small, and watching their behaviors and looking at their structure is a lot easier if you do it through a pair of binoculars and preferably a close focusing pair of binoculars. So um, with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put one more slide up here. So I'm gonna leave that there as a background. So I was hoping to point out some things that you can look for uh, when you watch bees. Um, and um, I think I pointed out most of these things during uh, the course of my presentation tonight. So um, I'd like to um, thank everybody for participating tonight and open up the program for more questions. Thanks, Michael. That was great. So you answered a few of these questions in your last couple of slides, but I'll share out a couple um, who are interested in more specifics about pesticides. So how do neonics affect bees and is it immediate or accumulative over time? So I'm, I, you know, I'm not a, um, I'm not a real ex, ex, um, expert about this, but neonicotino neonicotinoids, um, like some other pesticides are systemic pesticides. So when you put that, when you, when you treat a plant with that or you treat the, the seeds with that, seeds with that uh, pesticide, the pesticide is um, it's distributed throughout the plant and even to the pollen and the nectar of that plant. So bees and other pollinators that visit a plant that has been treated with neonicotinoids will, um, will eat or imbibe um, those pesticides. Now they're not always in a dose that's enough to directly kill them, but it may be enough to reduce their ability to, um, to function and to reproduce. Great, thanks, Michael. And then there's another question specific to insecticidal soaps. Are they okay to use for pests and are they not harmful to pollinators? Uh, so that's an interesting question. You know, uh, I, like I say, I'm not an, an expert on insecticides. Um, I think insecticidal soap is um, preferred to some other pesticides. <clears throat> um, 
and um, any pesticide. So the insecticidal soap is an insecticide that you do spray on a plant. And um, if, it, if an insect, any insect comes in contact with that, then I would imagine they're susceptible to, um, you know, to being impacted by that insecticide. Okay, so here are some pretty specific. How many bees sting? That's a good question. So um, it's a great question. It's, it's, a, it's a question that I probably should have addressed earlier. So um, like most people probably realize, it's only the females that can sting. Only females that have a stinger and, and can sting. And um, so um, to some degree, all female bees have the ability to sting, but many of our bees have a stinger that's too weak to penetrate human skin. So there are actually quite a few bees that you can pick up in your hands and they might attempt to, um, to sting you, uh, but are unable, un unable to. So um, if you've been stung, you've probably been stung by a wasp, by a social wasp or by perhaps a honeybee. Most of our native especially solitary bees are not apt to sting unless you um, like, um, what do I want to say? Like press them against your skin, you know, like they get underneath your clothing, between your clothing and your skin when you're out for a, a bicycle ride or you put, accidentally put your hand on them or something like that. They're very, they're very much not uh, aggressive and not going to waste their, their venom on you. Having said that also, most of bee stings are not, are not that painful. Take it from somebody who's been stung a lot of times, um, reaching my hand into an insect net and removing bees, uh, the vast majority of bee stings um, are not um, real painful and don't last very long, as opposed to like a yellow jacket sting or a honeybee sting, which really hurts and can last for a, for a longer time <clears throat> that you can have an allergic reaction to. So uh, you're unlikely to have an allergic reaction uh, to the sting from a solitary bee as you are from a social bee or a social wasp. Um, a couple of questions, Michael, about pollen. Is there an unlimited amount of pollen in each flower? Another good question. So um, there, there isn't. So um, um, plants um, produce only a certain amount of pollen. Um, they can only produce a certain amount each day throughout the flowering period. Um, um, as the anthers are ripening in the flower. So once the anthers in a flower ripen, the pollen um, is, is ripe and exposed and the bees can, can collect that. Um, so oftentimes in a flower, all the anthers don't ripen at once, but they ripen over a period of several days. So they're producing pollen over a period of time. Um, so just because a flower is open and you can see the petals doesn't necessarily mean that it is producing pollen at that time. Great. And then a pollen um, question that's specific. Do bees consume pollen from hemlock trees? Do bees have, uh, so that's a question I don't really know the answer to. Um, I don't know the answer to. So different types of pollen, you know, you know, um, hemlock trees are not bee pollinated. So hemlock trees, like all, all of our conifers are wind pollinated. So their pollen is, uh, hasn't evolved to be attractive to bees. So it's unlikely that bees are collecting their pollen. Great, so maybe we'll wrap it up with this question, which is a great one, because bees have such a short life as an adult. If we are seeing bees all summer, it seems like we are seeing different species throughout the season. 
Is there a little calendar that could help us ID the species based on when we see them? Um, you know, um, I don't know of a of a calendar. So, so um, identifying bees to species from sight is very difficult, almost impossible in most cases. Um, so, um, you know, there are some bees that are really distinctive. And there are some bee species, um, most bee species that are not very distinctive. So you can often look at a bee and know what genus it belongs to, um, but it's difficult to identify the species. Um, so there are there are genera that tend to to um, to emerge species of, of genera that tend to emerge uh, during certain times of the year. Um, but um, so uh, I guess in in essence, there could be a calendar um, of uh, more of, of genera than than species that you might be able to use. But but the, the bottom line is I don't know of a calendar um, that's available for that purpose. Thanks, Michael. This was a fantastic presentation. Really appreciate you being with us and. I will just share with the audience that this has been recorded and it will be posted on our YouTube channel. Um, probably take at least a week before it will get posted. Um, and we appreciate all of you coming tonight. So thank you again. And, Mike, and um, Michael, I'll just share that there are lots of comments about how wonderful your program was and fabulous talk, fascinating. So thank you. And I'll just also um, share that next week on June 8th, we have Heather Holm, who will be speaking about wasps. She is um, a very well-known author and entomologist, and she has just written and published a book totally on wasps. So it will be a very um, informative program next June 8th, next Tuesday. So I hope you all join us then as well. All right, thank you. Thanks, Michael. Good night, everyone.